everyone doing so far? All right, so thanks for being here. I think we're going to have a good time. We're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, we'll leave a lot of room for discussion and questions. And uh, let's just get right to it, shall we? So let's take a minute and ask God to bless us as we uh, take time to discuss this topic. <clears throat> God of grace, Lord, we, we come to you now because the reality is you have not sent your son yet to come and take us home. And while we are here, Father, we strive to live the most abundant life. And God, to that end, we pray that our mental health is, is optimized according to your will and mercy. And according also to the, to the strategies and the techniques that you have laid out in your word and revealed to us through nature. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, welcome. I'm Matt Chan or Matthew Chan. Um, I'm, I've been called Matthew or Matt this whole weekend, so I prefer either. No problem. You guys can just reach out. Whatever it is, do not call me doctor. Anything, please. That's all I ask. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the war on anxiety and depression. In the program it says sleep will follow this. That's not the case. We're going to make both hours this uh, same topic. So we're going to talk about uh, anxiety and depression. <clears throat> The reality is both of these conditions oftentimes go together. And fortunately, the treatment of both of these is almost exactly the same, at least the way we're going to talk about it this afternoon. I want to start with a Bible verse, Psalm 42, 11. By the way, I am going to lace this presentation with multiple Bible verses because I believe that the Word of God has healing and hope for each of us. Mental health is so stigmatized in our world today, especially in our church, and we don't think... We don't think we are affected because we say happy Sabbath and I'm fine. But the reality is there are some people among us that are deeply hurting. There are some people among us that are struggling and they are in need of healing from their brokenness. Psalm 42, 11 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Anyone ever feel downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior, and my God. I hope these texts can provide some encouragement for you this afternoon. We're going to start with a case study. I was at a university one time doing a student health clinic, and it was STD day, sexually transmitted disease day. So we were doing a lot of STD testing. We were talking about sex education. This was among college students at a local university just north of Los Angeles. And I'll never forget one patient came in for her annual checkup. You know, well woman checkup. I'm sure some of you have been to visits like that before. And as I'm seeing her, as I'm talking to her, I was intrigued by her story. I take what we call a sexual history. In other words, you know, we, we ask about partners and frequency and so on and so forth. So the first question I ask her is this, this young college student, How, uh, are you sexually active? Yes, I am. Next question, with men, women, or both? Well, well, both, actually. And I said, okay, well, how many partners, partners have you had? I've lost count. Wow. She was 19 years old. Aww. This girl was deeply depressed. Low energy, headaches, sadness, fatigue, hopelessness. You could see it in her eyes. She was looking for something. And she couldn't find it in all the relationships or the, the unhealthy relationships. Um, that she was pursuing at the time. And as I began to talk to her, it came really apparent to me that this girl could just as well be someone in my church. That this girl could be someone in my family. That this girl could be someone closer to home than I would otherwise expect. Because there's so much going on undercover, if you will, among so many of our friends and family and our church members. Um, we'd be surprised. And in fact... Not long after that encounter, I came across someone in our church. And we just had a casual conversation, and this is what she said to me. I feel like I'm not worth anything. I have no gifts or talents. I'm basically worthless. This is one of our youth. And so when language like this comes out, you automatically start to think, okay, well, what went wrong? What are some of the things you're doing wrong? And maybe we pass judgment on some of these uh, people because perhaps they're just, not, they're just not getting it. After all, the Bible says, come on, put your hope in the Lord. You can do this. But the reality is some people are handicapped biochemically, 
past tra uh, trauma, past experiences, or they're handicapped from some other factors as we'll get into because depression and anxiety are real things, just as much as a skin infection is. We don't bat an eye when you get an infection, you go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. But one of, if one of your church, church members has to go get counseling, oh, there's something wrong with that person, right? So I'm hoping to destigmatize, if you will, some of these mental health issues and to help some of us here today that would perhaps be struggling with some of these issues because it's so prevalent in our world today. How prevalent is it? Well, we see that in the um, early 2000s, a uh, very recent statistic, about 18% of Americans have been diagnosed with major depression. In the 1990s, it was about 9%, and so it doubled in about 10 years, the prevalence of, anxiety, of depression. And the numbers are climbing even more so. And if you look at this, this is a very expensive disease to treat and to deal with. We spend about $200 billion every year because of the economic consequences of depression. Women, unfortunately, are twice as likely to experience depression compared to men. And young people are more greatly affected than older Americans. And as we shall see, look at this graph here. You have young people, the prevalence among young people, 18 to 25, far outweighs those between 26 and 49 and 50 plus. Why are our young people so depressed? What is going on in the lives of our young people that is leading to such psychiatric, psychological disability, if you will, or impairment, I should say. So here, depression, you know, by the way, there's nothing wrong with feeling sad sometimes, right? You know, your, your dog dies, you know, my dog died a few years back, and I remember I cried for a week. <laughs> nothing wrong with being sad. Things happen, that's called normal. But the problem is when your sadness takes on a whole new level where it impairs your ability to function, you don't go out, you can't work, you can't concentrate, you have other physical manifestations. And so when it comes to depression, you have some people who have severe impairment, severe impairment, some people don't. So among adults, 64% have severe impairment in their because of their depression. Their functionality in life becomes impaired to a degree that we can actually diagnose a medical condition. This is among adults, 64%. Look at among young people, adolescents, 71% are impaired. 71%, that's almost three quarters of every young person who has depression has it to a point where their lives are so affected they don't do well in school. Their, their relationships have gone awry. All these different things, all these different major consequences of their depression. But here's the, here's the problem. 65% of adults, when they get diagnosed, they get treatment, right? If you're, you know, in middle age, 40, 50 years old, you have a diagnosed condition, you're more likely to get treated because there's a certain level of maturity there, right? You don't feel so bad going to the doctor, you probably have health insurance, you probably have a job, all that. But when it comes to young people, only 39% are getting treated. But they're the ones suffering the most impairment, yet they're getting the least treatment. Young people are at a great disadvantage when it comes to this problem. All right, let's take another breath. Deuteronomy 31.8, what does it say? Someone read it out nice and loud. Anybody? Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will strengthen and go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Amen. Do not be afraid or discouraged. If you're sitting here today because you are struggling with some of this, these verses are for you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Let's diagnose depression, okay? We actually have nine criteria by which we diagnose depression. The first of which is obviously something that most people think of when they think of depression, that is sadness, okay? And this sadness, um, we also call it a depressed mood. It has to occur most of the day, nearly every day, okay? And when people describe their sadness, they usually talk about feeling sad, empty, hopelessness, okay? And this observation can be made by the person or those around them, okay? Number two, apathy. They have no interest in doing things at all. There's a term called anhedonia. The things that used to give me pleasure, they don't give me pleasure anymore. I used to enjoy going for hikes at Camp Cedar Falls. Now I have no interest. I'm just going to stay in my lodge room this year. The things that I used to enjoy, I no longer, it doesn't get me going anymore. I'm just apathetic. I'm anhedonic, if you will, okay? And then you have weight change. 
And this could go in either direction. <coughs> Unintended weight changes. Whether you gain weight unintentionally or you lose, you're losing it. So this is a physical manifestation of a psychological problem. And then you have agitation or restlessness, okay? We call it psychomotor agitation. This thing cannot fall on me, <laughs> all right? Some people have actual psychomotor issues where they, they, you see their knees kind of always restless for some reason. Or perhaps they're just moving slower than normal. You know, you ever seen some people with certain posture, kind of a, a forward head posture? So this is this physical, um, visible manifestation of a psychiatric problem, okay? And then you have fatigue, profound fatigue. I mean, incapacitating fatigue. The type of fatigue where you don't want to wake up even though you slept for 10 hours, 12 hours straight. The type of fatigue that a nap cannot take care of. No matter how much ca caffeine and caffeine you keep pounding, you're just always tired. Okay? And then you have these feelings of worthlessness, feelings of guilt. Some people who are, are depressed, they're, they're just like guilt sponges. If they don't say yes to a favor, they, it, it, they, they feel bad about it for an entire month. Okay, so, so there's this idea of, of feeling um, worthless or, or, or guilty. And this is a big one. You cannot focus. Academic performance is impaired. Um, being able to perform at your job is, is, a, is a problem. You can't focus. Um, you can't concentrate. Okay? And lastly, suicidal ideation. Okay? All right, now here's the thing. Um, you can have, of these nine, in order to be diagnosed with depression, you need, to be, you need to have at least five of those. And let me go back here. You don't have to be sad. Does that make sense? You need to have at least this one or this one plus four others. Either sadness or apathy plus four others. So someone cannot necessarily feel sad, but they're tired all the time. They can't focus. Their weight is changing all these other things, and they, they don't take pleasure in certain activities anymore. So sadness is not a, a necessary feature when it comes to the diagnosis of depression. That's very important, okay? Sometimes the only thing that you'll tell that someone is uh, actually depressed is their profound fatigue and, and maybe some weight changes. Another verse break. Here we go. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles, okay? You see how the Bible is just replete with, with hope and encouragement, okay? All right, let's talk about the human brain. I mentioned it a little bit earlier this morning. The human brain is by far perhaps the most complex, complicated object in the universe. It's comprised of billions of nerve cells, brain cells, that are connected to each other in very complex ways. Certain brain pathways can be strengthened or weakened depending on how you think and how you act. Okay? You know how people say, just tell your brain to do this, tell your brain to do that. Can you do that? Yes, you can. And how do you do that? With your body. And we're going to talk a little bit about that biofeedback. The things you do with your body can impact the wiring of your brain. And we're going to talk a little bit about why, why exercise is so important when it comes to dealing with anxiety and depression. Okay, 100 billion neurons. It takes up 15% of the body's metabolism. We have 10,000 different synapses per neuron, okay? What is a synapse? A synapse is a connection, okay? So each neuron can have 10,000 different connections to 10,000 other different cells. And those connections can change over time. And like I said, they can either be weakened or strengthened depending on your activities. And then this is where I got that idea by this guy named Dr. John L. Raddy. He talks about um, the user's guide to the human brain, perception, attention in the four theaters of the brain. The brain is very complex. And what you'll see throughout this presentation is the way to deal with a lot of this stuff. You got to feed your brain good vibes. I mean, if I were to distill it down into just one statement, you got to feed your brain really good vibes, good stuff. And that includes nutrition and what you do with your body. Okay? Um, by the way, headache, um, depression has multiple um, effects throughout the rest of the body. The brain is connected to almost every single part of your body from head to toe. It's even connected to your toenail indirectly, believe it or not, okay? <laughs> so um, you'll see that depression has effects downstream from that because your brain is connected everywhere. You have headaches. Um, it even has influence or correlations with cancer, 
heart, your heart disease, job performance, GI health, marriage, academic, blood pressure, lung, osteoporosis, which is um, brittle and l low density of bones, liver issues, stomach, and back pain. Okay? So depression can affect multiple areas of our lives, both physically and socially and so forth. Okay? There's more seats in the front, guys. Um, got two here. All right. Okay. So now we've figured out what are the ways to diagnose depression, right? How do we diagnose depression by those nine criteria? And we've learned a little bit more about the brain and how it's connected to the entire body. Now let's figure out what actually causes depression. What are some of the actual causes of this very disabling, very prevalent condition, okay? So we have genetics, okay? Some people are actually just kind of prone because of what you get from your parents. And in the world of genetics, let me ask you a question. There's two different ways that genetics can influence your health. You have something called a genetic mutation versus genetic risk. Okay? What's a genetic mutation? A genetic mutation is quite simply when you have a specific gene that's either turned on or turned off. That's all it is or the gene changes and it looks differently the way it's supposed to look actually and when you translate into a protein that protein looks different so a genetic mutation is actual change in the sequencing of DNA genes can be turned on genes can be turned off proteins can look different okay you can absolutely inherit that from your parents for example like cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis is a genetic mutation both your parents have to have at least a recessive gene and then you can get it okay so that is in contrast to something called genetic risk, okay? Diabetes is a genetic risk factor. Just because your parents have diabetes, you're at risk for it genetically, but you don't have to get it, right? There is no gene for being overweight. There's no gene for uh, having diabetes. However, there are a bunch of genes that tend to influence the development of those diseases, okay? With depression, what do we have? You think it's a mutation or a risk? It's a risk. There is no depression gene that gets turned on. So, but there is a familial component. Your parents can be depressed, your grandparents can be depressed, and you are, may be at very high risk for depression, but that does not program you to the extent that you absolutely will have to suffer from depression. You may have to try harder than someone else who doesn't have that genetic risk, but you don't have to have it, okay? All right. So, oh, the famous quote by Dr. Murdoch, who worked at Loma Linda, endocrinologist. He says, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle or your environment pulls the trigger, okay? So now we have genetics. The next thing is development, okay? Um, the development, um, and I'll go real quickly with this, just, just know that if you're a mom and you have a child growing inside you, the way you think influences that child's risk for depression. Absolutely. What you do during the pregnancy can put your child at risk for various diseases, including depression. And then as you develop, as you grow, um, the way you're raised by your parents impacts your risk for depression. Okay? Um, these are some of the developmental factors. We have low birth weight, stressful life events, early life adversity, or early puberty. These are some of the developmental risk factors for depression, okay? All right, now we have lifestyle factors that can cause depression. What are some of these things? Well, let's talk about nutrition, <laughs> right? Um, these factors here, these nutrients, can you guys see from this side? Tryptophan, omega-3, folic acid, and vitamin B12, these are actually necessary to prevent um, depression. They're very good in preventing depression, I should say. Tryptophan, where do you find tryptophan besides in Thanksgiving turkeys that we probably shouldn't eat anyway? <laughs> right, you've... Say again? I was thinking more like soybeans, <laughs> soy and stuff like that, and tofu, things like that. Okay, omega-3s, which is a, a non-saturated fatty acid, folic acid, and vitamin B12s, which you find in green leafy vegetables. Vitamin B12, uh, can't find too much if you're a hardcore vegan, you're, isn't, it's not likely, so you're probably going to have to supplement, right? So, um, but the standard Western diet is very devoid of these nutrients. Instead of unsaturated fatty acids, we have highly saturated fatty acids, like we find in desserts and potato chips and things like that. 
all right? And then we don't eat a lot of vegetables, so we're not getting any folic acid and so forth. And we tend to just eat more calories than necessary. Other lifestyle factors, not enough exercise. Remember, motion. You can feed back to your brain the good stuff, the good vibes, right? Your brain, believe it or not, needs your body to be in motion. When you sleep, it's more for your brain than it is for your body. When you exercise, it's for everything. It's for your body and your brain. So exercise is incredibly important. If you and I aren't exercising, we become more at risk for so many other health effects, depression being one of them, okay? So if you're suffering from some of these symptoms, keep some of these things in mind, okay? As, as we go through this presentation, exercise is paramount. But my patients who I treat for depression, the first thing I do is I give them an exercise prescription. Sometimes I ask them, what do you do for exercise? What exercise, <laughs> right? And believe it or not, COVID, coming out of COVID, a lot of people with long COVID syndrome, many of them can be, I don't want to say cured, but significantly helped just with a regular exercise routine. Okay, exercise impacts so many different areas of your life. Yeah? What if you're an athlete? If you're an athlete, then you got it, you, you good. <laughs> yeah, because there's more than one cause, right? Absolutely, there's more than one cause, okay? But if we can cover as many bases as possible, you lower the risk of developing depression, and if you already have it, you can significantly improve your chances of avoiding antidepressants and improve your functionality. Okay? Yes. Good question. How much exercise is enough? Hmm, good question. Okay, so the standard recommendation is 20 to 30 minutes a day of moderate exercise. Moderate exercise is when you're doing it and you have a hard time finishing your sentence while you're doing it, okay? You can't really talk. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a spin class at a, you know, like soul cycle or whatever. I don't know how those instructors do it. They're going at a real fast pace and they're still able to talk and give that instruction. For them, that's probably not moderate. For you and I, moderate is if we're like walking up this hill to the lodge, which we've been doing back and forth here. That's probably moderate level. We want that to be 20 to 30 minutes per day, at least three days a week. I tell people, if you can get it up to five to six days a week of moderate, that's great, and increase it from there, okay? Well, the one thing that, I don't really practice a lot of what I preach, but this is what I do. I exercise almost every night, every night of the week, okay? And so, um, and sometimes if I don't feel like doing it, Tina will tell me to do it. And if she doesn't feel like it, then we're, we're always like encouraging each other. Exercise is incredibly important. It is foundational to overall health anyway, especially when it comes to mental health. Okay, I was gonna talk about sleep, but sleep is so, so important. I, we could spend two hours talking about how important sleep is. How much sleep do you think we need? Seven to nine. Seven to nine hours of sleep. Okay, this conference is not helping that, trust me. We're gonna stay out late, we're getting early. We need sleep. And by the way, <clears throat> let me just give you two tips of how to get better sleep, okay? Just two practical tips. Since I'm not doing the sleep lecture, I'll try to interject some little tidbits here. We need seven to nine hours of good quality sleep, okay? Two things. Number one, temperature. How many of you like to sleep with the heater on? Good, turn it off. 65 to 70 degrees. Ambient temperature. I like to keep it cold. My wife doesn't, so we kind of, we, yeah, the cooler the better. Why? When you sleep, your core body temperature needs to drop by about two to three degrees centigrade, your core body temperature. So a good way to achieve that, number one, sleep with the windows open or turn the AC on to cool the room down before you sleep, or take a warm bath or shower. Why warm? That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, when you take a warm bath or shower, what happens is your body compensates by opening up the blood vessels in your extremities, taking away the blood from the core, the core temperature drops, you sleep better, okay? So some of you who like to shower or take a bath in the evening, do so, increase the temperature of the water. When you get out, lower the temperature of your room, you'll sleep better. So that's number one, temperature for sleep. Number two, regularity. Every day, regardless of whether it's a weekday or a weekend, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, okay? You gotta have regularity, why? Our brains are very, they're associative devices, right? Um, they, they need um, regularity. They need to be regimented. Our brains need that. And if, it's, if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock one night, 4 a.m. the other night, 12 o'clock, your brain doesn't know when it's supposed to sleep, okay? What's the most, what, what's the popular sleep aid that people take out there over the counter? 
melatonin, right? People like to take melatonin. Melatonin does not actually make you drowsy per se, even though when you too do take it, you feel drowsy. What melatonin does, it kickstarts, it tells your brain, oh, it's time to sleep. The way we do that naturally without taking a supplement is what? Light and day. Circadian rhythm, yeah. That is correct. Slower change is better. So long as you're heading in the right direction and you do it slowly. Because you, how much oh, should you make to get your body used to it? That I don't I don't know if there's any specific rate at which we can change, but if you if you can do it a half hour to an hour per night change every you know as you go, I think that would be fine. But I agree. The drastic change is, is hard for your body and your mind. Some people can do it, no problem. You know, we're all built a little bit differently. But sleep is vitally important to making sure you have good mental health. I'm going to give you the third point about sleep, okay? The brain has something called the prefrontal cortex right here, okay? And below the prefrontal cortex is something called the amygdala, part of your emotional side, right? So here is your executive function. Below that is your emotional side. When you and I deal with the stresses of life, you know, talking to a coworker, arguing with your spouse, dealing with your kids, those things accumulate in, in, in the brain, right? They accumulate all in the brain. And when you sleep at night, what happens is the brain actually, the cortex and that lower um, emotional side, has this, this, the connection between those two parts of the brain becomes stronger. And so it actually cleans out all the stress of the day. That's why you ever, you ever just take a nap and you just feel better after an argument or after a stressful time. You know, sleeping on it really, really makes a difference. When you don't get enough sleep, that connection between the, the cortex and the, the emotional side gets broken. And what happens is all those negative emotions just surface the next day, and that's why we're so short when we're tired and cranky, right? So that ability to kind of suppress the, the, those, those stressful emotions is hard. So again, can't stress enough. People who are depressed, regulate your sleep. Do better with sleep. So nutrition, exercise, and sleep, incredibly important, okay? All right, uh, we talked about addiction this morning, okay? The, oftentimes, um, addiction and these mental health problems, they go hand in hand, okay? Alcohol, cigarettes, um, prescription medications, and caffeine. Speaking of caffeine, <clears throat> um, how does caffeine work? It's a stimulant, right? But it works by, by blocking something. There's something in your brain. So melatonin tells you when you're supposed to sleep. But what actually makes you feel sleepy? There's a chemical called adenosine. Adenosine throughout the day, like right now, as you're sitting here, some of you have a lot more adenosine than others. You're sitting here, and adenosine is accumulating, and it creates what's called a sleep pressure. And so that sleepiness is sleep pressure. What caffeine does, it goes in and it blocks adenosine. And so you're awake. You feel wakefulness, OK? The problem is, if you drink coffee in the morning at around 8 o'clock in the morning, the half-life of caffeine is about 8 hours, okay? So 8 o'clock, what's 8 hours after 8 o'clock? 4 p.m., you have half of what you had at 8 o'clock, the concentration of caffeine in your body. And then another 8 hours from 4 until, let's see, what does that take us to? Midnight, right? From midnight, you have a quarter of what you drank. That quarter sometimes is enough to prevent you from going into the deep restorative stages of sleep. You'll fall asleep, but you're missing out on the deeper stages of sleep. Some of you may have experienced that, yeah. If you drink water, yeah. constant water, yeah. throughout the day, sure. will decrease? You know, the half-life of any chemical in your body is more dependent on your metabolism. Water does influence to some degree. So the answer is yes, but not as much as we would think because a lot of it really just depends on your metabolism, how fast you metabolize, and that just really has to do with muscle mass and, and other, other things like that. But that's a good question, yeah. So, but, it's a, but even so, it's a good idea to make sure you're hydrating well, okay? All right, so substance abuse and all these substances, they really, really take a, a toll when it comes to um, our, uh, our depression and our mental health, okay? Social factors, all right. Social factors, wow, this is, this is gonna be important for us, okay? Um, some of us are depressed because we're in the wrong occupation. 
there's a good, there's a, not a good fit between what you're doing in life and what you're calling your true purpose is, okay? Um, some of us have a lack of social support. This is a risk factor for depression, okay? And then there's codependency, really toxic relationships. That can be an issue as well. Um, low social class has been associated with higher risks of depression, okay? And uh, social media. Did that show up yet? Yeah, social media, okay? Let me show you a, a quick study. Sleepy teens, social media use in adolescence is associated with poor sleep, anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem. We can spend a lot of time here talking about the neurologic and emotional effects of heavy social media use. It's a big problem in our world today. And let's see, we look at another study here, use of multiple social media platforms and symptoms of, and symptoms of depression. A nationally representative study among US adults. What were some of the highlights? There is a linear association between the number of platforms used and depression. Linear means the line just goes up like that. Okay, rates of depression and the amount of social media that's used. And there's another association between the number of platforms and anxiety, not just depression, but also anxiety. And associations remain strong after controlling for total time of social media use. So if I were to give someone some advice who has mental health problems, one piece of advice I give to them, delete your Facebook account. It's not worth it. Delete your Facebook, get off Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, all these things. These devices, these social media platforms, trust me, they do not have your best interest in mind. Not at all. Not at all. If you find yourself at risk for some of these problems, depression, anxiety, delete your account. I'm not, I'm, we, can't, we don't have time to describe, go talk to Scotty Mary. He has tons of presentations <laughs> about social media and, and the brain. But it is, it, it is, it is vitally important if you want to maximize and optimize your ability to overcome depression, overcome anxiety, delete all your social media accounts. It is much better to hang out in person. Yeah. You're a witness. The Lord took that away. I didn't know that was causing my depression. Get rid of that. Get rid of it. Down the line, I got my sleep back. Joy, everything else. And he was right. He knew what was wrong. Exactly. I am the least social person online. I have no social media accounts. Zero. <laughs> Don't find me on Facebook because you can't. All right. Okay. So we have social factors, and what else do we have? Medical issues. So there's a lot of medical factors that lead to depression. Um, you know, someone's get diagnosed with cancer. Someone has um, a major operation. You know, a, a limb amputation and things like that. It's normal to feel sad when those things happen. But again, there's a point beyond which is no longer normal, when it impairs your ability to function, you might have clinical depression, and there are medical factors associated with that. You can be treated as well using some of the strategies we're about to outline. Okay, let's take a breath. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. Guys, lift your heads up high. You are sons and daughters of God Almighty. You and I are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. We are princes and princesses, right? Lift your head up high. Don't forget who your heavenly father is. Okay, let's talk about some treatment for depression. We're going to break it down by three categories. We're going to start with lifestyle, medical, and then spiritual, okay? Treatment for depression, okay? Yes. Yeah, please, I'm sweating here. Ooh, spider webs. Okay. What time is it, Benny? They don't have the time? Yeah, 3.30. 3.30, okay. What is it? Oh, so we have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. No, 10 minutes. 4, till 4. Oh, till 4? 4.50. Okay, I'll just wait till someone comes in and tells us to stop. <clears throat> okay, lifestyle interventions, okay? If you are struggling with mental health, let us focus on the lifestyle, because I'm, I'm going to make this foundational here, okay? This is the foundation. Remember, the things that you put in your body and the things that you do with your body matter. That's one way I would define lifestyle. The things you put in your body and the things you do with your body, that also includes your mind. The things you put in your mind and the things you do with your mind, that is lifestyle. So let's talk about some basic lifestyle interventions for depression, okay? We talk about nutrition, okay? We advocate for a whole foods, plant-based diet. 
okay? A whole foods plant-based diet. I always tell my kids, eat your colors. And if you would see them in the cafeteria, they're not eating their colors. We are trying, we strive to get them to eat more colors, okay? There is healing in plants. There's healing in what God has provided in the foods that we eat. We think that we're eating healthy because we want to avoid heart disease. That is true. But if you are dealing with mental health, you need to optimize your diet. It is foundational, okay? Potato chips, Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> all these things, they clog arteries, they increase inflammation in the body, they give you ups and downs of energy that mess with your mind. You and I do not need to subject ourselves to some of these problems. Tryptophan, can we talk a little bit about tryptophan? You guys know what serotonin is? Antidepressants work by preventing serotonin from going away. So in other words, it allows serotonin to accumulate because people who are depressed have low serotonin. Guess what? Tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, okay? And the, the, the metabolic pathway that leads to that chemical starts with tryptophan. The same is true for melatonin. Melatonin and serotonin sound the same, which is why when people eat turkey, which is high in tryptophan, they get sleepy because tryptophan is a precursor to melatonin. The same is true for serotonin. You can actually take tryptophan supplements that are out there. And I always go back to the beans and legumes when it comes to foods that are high in tryptophan, okay? So focus on foods that are high in tryptophan. Omega-3s, unsaturated fatty acids. <clears throat> What's a good source of omega-3 fatty acids? Fish. Fish is good, but if you want to do whole foods plant-based, where else can you go? Flaxseed. Flax Chia. Chia seeds is good. Almonds. Walnuts. Okay, very high in omega-3s, okay? Um, when it comes to omega-3 fatty acids, not only good for mental health, believe it or not, omega-3s are so good about just lowering inflammation altogether, okay? When it comes to inflammation, omega-3s are very powerful uh, chemicals to lower the amount of inflammation in the body, but also brain health. One of the reasons why omega-3s are good for depression is because it promotes good brain health. You know, they say um, a walnut, what does a walnut look like when you look at it? It's like a brain. It's easy to remember. You want to eat, do something good for your brain? Eat a walnut. Why is it good? Because of omega-3s, okay? Folate is a very important chemical for healthy neurons in the brain. You need folate, especially in early childhood, because of brain development, okay? Folate, the best thing I think of when I think of folate is green leafy vegetables, uh, spinach especially, okay? And then vitamin B12. We're going to have to supplement there because we don't eat cod liver oil and stuff like that, or at least most of us don't, okay? So you'll have to supplement with vitamin B12. So oftentimes when people are, are suffering from depression, you're going to have to take some supplementation there, okay? All right. Um, another lifestyle intervention. We talked a little bit about exercise already. Um, cardio, aerobic, and weights. I want to talk to the women in the audience now. You need to be lifting weights, okay? You go to 24-hour fitness, you see all these meatheads there lifting and, and all that. They need to leave and make room for the women. Why? Women benefit tremendously from lifting weights, but they're, they're mostly on the treadmill, which is fine. You do need your cardiovascular and aerobic exercise, but lifting weights for women is healthy because of depression, also because of risk of breast cancer and osteoporosis. Yeah. Yeah, of course they can. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, the, the, um, that is a myth that people who are vegan don't get enough protein. That is an, uh, there's enough protein. You know, you think of fruits. Fruits are very carb heavy. But an apple and orange together has enough protein to sustain a person for the entire day. There's enough protein. And now, now imagine you put that with the beans and then the nuts and some of these other things and seeds and all that and all these other vegetables. Plenty of protein. And some would argue even higher quality protein more identical, what we call bioidentical, more similar to the essential amino acids that, that our body uses to actually build protein. So one, one way, there's, there was a documentary that I have not seen. It has Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. Do you know the name of it? I, f I forgot what it was. <clears throat> Something like that. But the, it showcases a bunch of people who look like they do nothing but whey protein all day. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's, it's absolutely a myth that you have to, you can bulk up on. So if you're a guy, you want to bulk up, you don't have to, you know, take too much supplementation. 
changers. Yes, game changers. I haven't seen it yet, but if some of you have seen it, then you know what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, so that's cool. Um, so, so I always encourage women to lift weights. I was because it's you know it, it's a little intimidating for them because it's kind of you know countercultural. We don't really see a lot of that happening. But like I said, when it comes to osteoporosis and breast cancer and mental health, lifting weights really, really is sometimes just a good outlet. Just kind of get all that get all that stress out, right? So absolutely, spending time outdoors, guys. We're in the right place for that. But let me tell you right now, most of us don't have big, giant size acreage in, in these beautiful countries and so forth. You got to get your kids outdoors. You got to go outdoors with your family. You got to do it. You got to do it. COVID was horrible because all we did was spend time indoors. You know, I, I saw some kids in our church before COVID. They were normal kids. After COVID, they still have their mask on. They have their hoodies over them, and they're like this. All throughout the entire church service. And, you know, we sit in there for two hours, and they're indoors all the time. You got to get outdoors. Sunshine and fresh air will do you wonders. Getting out in nature. There's this idea of forest bathing. Forest bathing has impact not just for mental health, but also your immune health as well. And communing with nature is so important. That's one of the reasons why I'm so happy that we're having this conference here versus at some hotel or a resort. Yes? How do you get out of nature if you live in the city? You're just out of luck. You're just out of luck. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> exactly. That's what, get, out, get, get in your car and drive, okay? There's, there's places. And there's parks, absolutely. The beach. I was during COVID, I was at the beach. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have long COVID patients right now that we're trying to rehab. I actually assign them five days a week to go to an outdoor place, whether it's a park, the beach, Griffith Park. We live in LA, so we have Griffith Park, tons of hiking trails. They need to spend one hour per day outdoors doing something physically demanding, and it's working for them. They never thought in a million years that this would be going on, uh, that, that this would help them, but it does, because we live in a society that's so, so enclosed, okay? One thing I forgot to put here is water. I just mentioned it quickly. Hydrating, okay? How much water do you think an average adult needs to drink per day? How many liters? Four for men, about three, three and a half for women, okay? Four liters, uh, those big soda bottles that are two liters, imagine two of those. That's how much we, up here we need more. It's drier out here and, and, and you know, there's a lot of, a lot of wind and, and sun and so forth. So we're losing, we lose about one and a half liters per day just by walking around, okay? Not even going to the restaurant. If you just walked around, you're losing it through your skin. Those are called insensible losses. You don't sense that fluid loss, but you're losing about one and a half liters of water per day just by walking around, talking, and breathing. It does. It does a little bit, but on average, on average, about four liters. So, so I, I, I'm glad to see, you know, Maisha's got a water bottle, perfect example right there, right? So you want to drink a lot of water per day. And oftentimes, some of the, the, the physical symptoms of depression can be ameliorated just by drinking more water. I'm talking about the headaches and the fatigue. Sometimes you feel tired, but really what it is, you're just dehydrated. You don't even know it. Okay? Yes, and especially if you're exercising, where you're going to get more, okay? All right, and then uh, the last lifestyle intervention, obviously, is sleep. We mentioned that already. Good sleep hygiene. We talked about regularity. We talked about temperature. Um, avoiding caffeine, minimizing stimulation. Okay, so what do you, what's your bedtime routine, guys? What, what do you guys like to do to get ready for bed? Read the Bible, pray, meditate, stretch. Okay, is sleep a switch you can just turn on and off? No, okay? So what do you do? How should you think of sleep? Think of sleep like an airplane that's about to land. What does a pilot do before it lands? It prepares. It prepares. Drop the landing gear. Tells all the passengers to buckle up. Um, they communicate with the air traffic, what are they other? Air tower, control tower. Um, there's a lot of preparation that needs to happen as that plane finally hits the runway. Once you land, you're asleep. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, the glides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you're, you're hovering down to, to get to sleep. So, so don't, don't think that you can hammer away at your laptop staring at that bright light, you know, from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and then turn off and fall asleep. It doesn't work that well for most people. Some people can do that, but not everybody. So if you're someone who's struggling with some mental health issue, sleep hygiene is important. That includes preparation, having a routine before you go to bed, a bedtime routine. I recommend stretching, meditation, essential oils, right? 
I'm not an essential oils expert, but I do have essential oils. I actually put some peppermint on earlier today just to kind of wake me up this afternoon. <laughs> you know, so, so I like essential oils. Some of you have diffusers. You put in. So these little routines, they make a difference because and if you do the routine every day, remember, that's regularity. You got to have that regular because your brain needs to be regimented in order to have good sleep. Um, I talked about optimal temperature. Oh, and don't exercise too late, by the way. I mean, you know, don't exercise too late because your body needs to cool down. From that, from that exercise activity. And remember, the body's temperature needs to, to drop um, uh, before it really falls asleep, okay? So really, really important. Three basic lifestyle interventions. I'm gonna say this is foundational. So remember, eat well, hydrate well, exercise and get good sleep. Foundational, if you're struggling with anxiety or depression, you need to regimen. Will this take care of all your symptoms all the time? Depends on your cause, depends on the severity. But many people have been lifted from depression and anxiety simply by starting the, these, two, these three factors right here. I had a patient, quick story. She was a nurse at the hospital, got COVID really bad. She was sick for months. She was referred to our office. I started to take a history of what her lifestyle was like. She was having a lot of long COVID symptoms, mood disorder, headaches, low energy, shortness of breath, a mild residual cough. And I started to ask her what she, what she does. She drinks about four to five cups of coffee per day, <laughs> hardly any water, doesn't exercise. She wasn't, you know, morbidly obese, but she was, she was getting there. She eats dessert at every meal, okay? And I asked her, well, tell me about vegetables. Are you eating vegetables? I don't like vegetables. And that's what she said, I don't like vegetables. And her meals were all over the place because she was a busy nurse. Her meals were all over the place and her sleep was all over the place. And so we started small. I said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to buy a one liter water bottle and carry it with you wherever you go and drink as much as you can. Every day I want you to finish that at least three times, okay? And she did that. She started with that, just with that. In two weeks, her energy level went from 50% to about 60 to 75% just by drinking more water. Then we started working on her sleep. It was hard because of her job, but on the days that she was off, she made sure she went to bed at the same time and woke up at the same time. Her energy level started to come back to normal. Okay, she's almost 100% done with her long COVID symptoms right now just by water and sleep and now she's adding exercise. We haven't touched the nutrition yet. <laughs> That's a hard one, okay? <laughs> but this stuff is evidence-based. It has been studied. It is a verifiable fact that you and I can deal with these symptoms of depression using lifestyle and avoid medications, okay? Okay, um, oh, by the way, the other, I have two more. Two more lifestyle factors, the frontal lobe. Remember, we talked about the frontal lobe. Stimulate your frontal lobe, okay? What does the word amuse mean? You go to an amusement park, you sit down and you watch a movie and you're amused. What, is, what does amuse mean, to be amused? Huh? To be entertained. The word, okay, so let's take the word amuse. What does muse mean? Take the A out, what does muse mean? To think, to, to think, to surmise, to concentrate, to contemplate. So to muse means to look at something and you're you're thinking about it, right? You're using that frontal lobe. So amuse is the opposite of muse. So to be amused is to not think. You shut off that frontal lobe. We live in a society that thrives of not thinking. Because we love our movies, we love shows, we love to sit and to be entertained. Social media is part of that as well. It shuts off the frontal lobe. You shut off that frontal lobe, you're at risk for more and more depression. Because if you stimulate the frontal lobe, what happens is, man, that connection between the frontal lobe and the limbic system is strengthened and it has the ability to suppress some of those feelings, to control and keep it at check, okay? I call it your lizard brain. There's a lizard brain down there that just wants to creep up, but the frontal lobe keeps it in check. So you have to have a healthy frontal lobe. We started playing more classical, we just, Tina and I, we just got back from a homeschooling convention last week. It was great, this Christian homeschooling convention. We learned so much. And I've always enjoyed classical music, but now I'm trying to get my kids into it more. And so we play classical music throughout the house now. They don't care for it much, but at least we're trying to get that frontal lobe stimulation, okay? You got you to gotta figure out ways to stimulate them. Read more. Kids aren't reading enough these days. And if you have kids, read to your kids. You got to read more, okay? Learn to enjoy books. Get that frontal lobe stimulation going. You guys know this term, thought distortion? What's a thought distortion? I'll give you a perfect example. My wife, we, we used to have parking lot church at our church when it was COVID. And what happens in parking lot church? You don't just have church, it's a parking lot, so you have cars too, right? 
So the cars would be driving in and out of where we're having our parking lot church. And not only were there cars, but then there's our kids running around the parking lot with cars running around during parking lot church. And I thought, okay, there's cars in the parking lot. Let's just try to keep our kids from getting run over by cars. No, no big deal. Tina, on the other hand, says, no, those are death traps. Okay? Clear thought disorders. That's not a death trap. <laughs> they're not going to die because they're having parking lot church, right? So sometimes we, we, we catastrophize. We take something that is you know, seemingly innocuous, and then we blow it out of proportion. So we have to control those thoughts. And that's why it's so true. The way we think influences how we feel. How we feel influences the way we behave. So getting rid of thought distortions is a key element of therapy, a key element of cognitive behavioral therapy. We need to flip it around, turn it around. When you walk upstairs and you see Legos all over the place, instead of saying that your kids are a bunch of slobs, and they probably are, I don't know, you should say, wow, look at this creativity. Wow, look at what they're doing. Switch it around. Okay? When you're driving to work and that guy cuts you off, Instead of saying, you, you know, you say, oh, okay, well, you know, he's probably later than I am. I'll let him go ahead of me. <laughs> Switch it around. Yeah. Clear those thought distortions, okay? We talked about minimizing amusement. Read something daily. Get that frontal lobe as stimulated as you possibly can. A lot of people, okay, five minutes. A lot of people who have depression don't do enough of that. Again, we talk about social factors. Hey, if you can change your job, change your job. Some people are truly, legitimately depressed because they're in the wrong occupation. Okay? My brother was that way. He quit his job, and now he's trying to do something else. It's probably not a good fit either. But again, sometimes you just got to quit your jobs. Have healthy relationships. We we're talking a lot about relationships here. Um, learn from some of the talks here about how to have these healthy relationships and to keep the toxic ones at bay. Yeah? Yeah. Then that's, you know, you'll just have to weigh it all out. You know, I mean, it, then if you can address everything else and see if that one thing can be sustained while, while not impairing your ability to function from a mental health perspective, then that may be something you can still integrate into your life. Yeah. But if it's not necessary for your, to make a living, I see no reason for social media. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what did I say? I said delete, go to church, delete Facebook, destroy Instagram, erase Twitter, be reconciled. <laughs> Get a dog, right? I don't know how else I can say it. Destroy it, erase Twitter, that's, that's what I've got there. Okay, um, another lifestyle intervention, okay? And I'm, I'm sorry I'm going so fast. I was hoping for more time for discussion, but feel free to interject at any time with questions or comments, okay? Self-care. Guys, go get a massage. Spoil yourself for, for a day out, a spa day. Take personal days. Keep a clean house and proper grooming. Very, very important. Okay? Have you walked into a teenager's room lately? A teenage boy's room. Some of you are that teenage boy room right here, sitting here. Okay? Keep a tidy house. Cleanliness is next to godliness, right? You want, and also groom yourself well, okay? Even if you're not going somewhere on the weekends, wake up and groom yourself. You know, get your hair done, shave, put on nice clothes, because it makes a difference. What are you doing? You're telling your brain that it's okay. Okay, you're telling your brain good things. Remember, you're feeding, your, if, you know, everything you're doing, you're feeding your brain good vibes. Everything we're talking about here, the lifestyle interventions, you gotta feed your brain good vibes. And getting massage is very important, okay? You know, I've had a conversation with someone about acupuncture. Acupuncture has been actually shown to be successful at treating depression, but some people have this thing about acupuncture. So I took it out of the presentation. So we're going to talk about massage, which works almost the same way. Massage really gets rid of those knots. It releases endorphins. It gets the muscle tension out. And it's something that you should do regularly if you are struggling with anxiety or depression. There was a time in my life where I was going at least once a week Okay, to get a massage, um, and it really, really helps. Okay, let's take a breath. That's another thing, is deep breathing, very important. You have turned for me my morning into dancing. I love that. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. I love that. Okay, let's talk very quickly about some medical interventions. Um, 
We're going to talk about therapy, 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 therapy. Okay, foundationally is lifestyle. Get that foundation really, really solid, and then get some counseling. If you're struggling from anxiety or depression, you need to be in counseling, period. No questions asked. I don't let my patients get away with not going to counseling. You need to go to cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, motivational interviewing, family therapy. Been there, done that. It works. Been there, done that. Trust me. It works. Okay? There, there's no shame in getting help. And you need to get help from the right person. If, it's, if you don't have a good rapport with your therapist, find a different therapist. Okay? If your insurance doesn't pay for it, find a friend that can help you pay for it. It is that important. Because you really need to start working out these thought distortions. You got to start working out the way that your mind is working. Therapy rewires the brain. Okay, on functional MRI, the therapy rewires the brain the same as an antidepressant does, but without any of the side effects. Okay? Serotonin has been found to increase after a few months of therapy in like manner to taking Zoloft or Prozac, but without the side effects. Okay? All right, here's some basic supplements that you can jot down. Um, St. John's wort, chamomile, lavender, again, some essential oils there, lemon balm, ginkgo biloba. Not a whole lot of science has gone into researching some of this stuff, but a lot of people like the anecdotal evidence that seems to support their efficacy in treating anxiety and depression. And lastly, if everything fails, I don't want anyone to feel shame for being prescribed antidepressants. But work with a good doctor. Because you don't want to be at on, you do not want to be on antidepressants longer than you need to be. Lowest dose, low short amount of time. Okay? There, are, there is toxicity associated with these medications, but they work for a lot of people. You cannot deny that. I can't deny that. The patients that I have prescribed it to, it works and it helps. I don't like to keep them on longer than necessary because everything else, and we only get to this point after we've laid the foundation of lifestyle, after we've laid the foundation of therapy, and maybe add some supplements. Yeah. Yes. And um, you have a bout of depression. Mm -hmm. So you know, is it easier to have another bout like, for it to happen again? Yeah, that's a, good that's a really good question. Yeah. People who are at risk for depression, one of the risk factors is prior episodes. Mm -hmm. Prior episodes, yeah. So you have to be aware of that, OK? OK, so um, any questions about any of this so far? OK. Comments, discussion, confessions, complaints, <laughs> criticisms, nothing? Okay, we're almost done. A few more slides, okay? Let's take another deep breath. Isaiah 40, 31, who wants to read that for us? Anyone? Any takers? Thank you. Whew. Wow. You know, on a really bad day, I can read that verse, and it just, like, it just gets me right here. <laughs> okay? Keep the word close, okay? Let's talk about spiritual intervention, okay? Benefits of a strong spiritual life, uh, social support, feelings of belonging, frontal lobe stimulation, remember reading, reading, self-worth, healthy habits is an outlet for stress, wholesome recreation, group care. All these things are part of having a strong spiritual life. The fellowship you and I have in church, do not discount what that does for your mental health. Having a spiritual family is so important. You don't feel alone. If you don't have a, an immediate family to be your support, find a good spiritual family. Get connected with a men's group. Get connected with a women's group. Get on the prayer line. Go to prayer meeting. Join a Bible study. Even if you don't even understand what they're talking about in the Bible study, do it for the social interaction. You're going to need it. We all need it, okay? There's a lot to benefit there. Uh, group prayer, invoking the power of the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say? The, um, what is it? We're, we are told through counsel that the Holy Spirit communicates to us through our brains and central nervous systems, right? So that constant connection with the Holy Spirit does have the ability to rewire some of the circuitry there, okay? And they've looked into this, okay? Um, going to church, interpersonal, and so compared to attending services less than once, a month or never, attending services once a week but no more is associated with fewer depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. 
hypothesize mediators, including meaning interpersonal and self-forgiveness, okay? Going to church is a way to treat depressing, depression. <clears throat> and it's been studied. They've, been, they've actually validated some of these um, studies. All right? Okay, oh, one more study. Religion and remission of depression in medical inpatients with heart failure and pulmonary disease. Patients involved in group-related religious activities experienced a shorter time to remission, although numerous religious measures were unrelated by themselves to depression outcome. The combination of frequent religious attendance, prayer, Bible study, and high intrinsic religi religiosity predicted a 53% increase in speed of remission. Okay? Going to church helps. Having your spiritual family helps. Coming to CYC helps. And if you need that strong social support, find it today. Get some numbers. Okay? Get on the prayer line. You're going to need that social support. It's very, very important. Okay, lastly, this is um, something about hope, okay? Oftentimes, one of the major causes, we, as we hinted at earlier, one of the major causes of depression is stress, adverse life events, okay? We have stress, and that leads to high levels of cortisol, which is a hormone in the body. When that happens, then we get to depression. So we can see this biochemically. And when we have depression, we have hopelessness, which leads to suicide in some cases, unfortunately. Okay, there's a Bible verse that says the following, Romans 5, 3 to 6. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings, stress, produces, not cortisol, perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope, not hopelessness. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We talked about thought distortions. You have a choice. When you go through an adverse life event, a stressful event, you can either let it produce cortisol, or here, Paul says it can produce perseverance. So let's redo our graph. Stress, cortisol, or depression, or hopelessness, or Paul's way. Suffering produces perseverance, which produces character that leads to hope. Amen. If you claim that promise, if you claim that promise, my prayer is that God will heal you that God will restore you and break the chains, okay? All right, anything else? Questions, comments, discussion? No one's chasing us out yet. Or are they? I don't know. Are you wanting to come in for the next session? Are you, are you coming in for the... Okay, okay, yes, one question there. Is bipolar disorder a type of depression? Bipolar has depression in it. It is not a type of depression. There's two types of bipolar, bipolar 1 and 2. And it is marked, it has elements of depression in it. Good question. Yeah? You mentioned uh, water. Is there anything, I've been told different, different things. If you leave water out and the plastic, you know, get toxic. Is there a problem with drinking toxic water? Yes, uh, you're probably talking about BPA. So BPA is a chemical that's used to make these polymers that we have in plastic water bottles, and it has been found to leach into the water over time. Some people believe that it is a carcinogen. I'm not too well versed in that. It's not a little bit beyond my scope of expertise, but I have heard some of those studies. But we do got to close now. But thank you for your participation. Let's have a brief word of prayer. God, we thank you for the hope that is in Christ Jesus. If there's someone here today that needs to be healed and restored of anxiety or depression, we declare in the name of Jesus right now, Father, that you will put them on the road to recovery and carry them all the way through. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.